The difficulties in gaining acceptance of herpes 6 as a causative agent, let me add herpes 7 to that. Every time you see 6, add 7. Uh, or, or even as an important cofactor in a disease. It's okay with babies. I mean, Dr. Yamanishi, you know, hit it right on target when he went after a infant disease. But think about it in adults where the population has a significant number of people infected. Very difficult to prove causation. Frankly speaking, that's when I decided to say farewell. I couldn't think of a way of proving things without a specific drug or a primate model. And there, I tried to get specific drugs. I went to Astra Pharmaceuticals. This was long, long ago, probably around 1988. And I failed. And uh, we didn't have any primate model of anything or any animal model of anything. I just didn't know which way to turn. I didn't know if we could do anything with transgenics. And so there was other things hanging heavy on me. So I just I kind of gave up. So the failure to distinguish A from B sometimes is also a problem. I notice that it's much better this time than it was in Barcelona. Now, if people here really believe, I'll come back to this point, that A and B are different in their primary cell tropism in any way, if they believe that there's a difference in disease causation, it is certainly enough to say to, di to always distinguish A from B. I don't want to get into the point that I raised last two years ago in Barcelona that we really need to make the decision on nomenclature that these are if these are different viruses and rethink all these later herpes viruses as 6, 7, 8, 9, et cetera, there would be a lot of resistance to that probably in the field. But if they really have dis different disease and different primary cell tropism, you can't say the, I don't care what the genomic uh, details are, it'll be massively confusing to think of them as one virus. So if there's no name change, at minimum, if there's agreement that there are differences in the biology or disease, everybody who works on it needs to distinguish A from B from 7. I mean, without a doubt. I think you'd all agree with that. Otherwise, we're gonna have a, you're going to have a total mess, which was much worse in my view a few years ago. I think there's been significant strides as I look at the abstract, I must say. And then they have this problem of the numerous diseases in which herpes 6 is said to be involved. This is a partial list, as you all know, roseola, chronic fatigue, a subset of epilepsy, lymphomas, multiple sclerosis, other neurologic diseases, a variety of inflammatory disorders, uh, a cofactor in AIDS progressions, and more. That's a big pill to swallow if you're outside the field, right? I mean, so uh, the frequency of the virus in adult populations, I've already said, raises a problem. And finally, the lack of serious funding really kills the field in many respects if you don't get more money. And that was a topic of conversation bluntly two years ago. So what's going to be needed to convince people it plays a causative or cofactor role in one or more human diseases? Obviously, precise assays. I'm not telling you anything. Much confirmatory data. Primate models or other animal models. Clinical trials. Eventually, it is hoped with a specific inhibitor of herpes 6, or prove that the other herpes virus that is also inhibited is not involved in causation of that disease, one or the other or both. Agreement in the field to focus on a few important diseases. Now, you know, everybody likes to publish. You find an association. You have a lot of virus replication. Here's another phenomena, another syndrome. But I would hope that there could be agreement to focus on let's say two to three max important diseases and get better funding. And I put at the bottom, no, I don't know how. So we have, a, this is the only slide from two years ago. I, I said I used this slide then. The classic dilemma, the key discoveries and incontrovertible evidence are needed to get serious money. But serious money? is needed to get such discoveries and evidence. So we have this circle, and I don't know how to break the law. Yeah, PR helps, puts pressure on NIH. That's for sure. So when you have something you're convinced of from the field, isn't a bad idea at this stage to augment um, maybe a, more than you would do at another period of the field, the individual, the university, the observation, and have people standing behind it. But it has to be that there is 
reasonably broad agreement in the field. If you have somebody else commenting that, oh, well, I'm not really convinced, and that's in the same news article, it just will throw more harm to the field. Uh, but you do need some visible PR occurring in some important diseases, if that can be done with agreement. So in Barcelona, I made note that it will be cr critical for everyone to make clear-cut distinctions between A and B and 7. It, it should all be automatic in all these statements. In all studies, if the field really concludes that there are real differences, I already made this point, in their distribution and or their association with disease and or in some of their important lab features, particularly tropism for primary cells. It seems to me this is occurring now, but is it uniform? Or are, those, are there those in this room who do not believe that the differences are consequential? So one would say it's nice to have report after report. It would be good to have some panel discussion whether uh, you don't need 100 percent, but is there strong feelings by people who have established themselves in the field and uh, who would debate this conclusively that these differences are real? And what do we know about target cell similarities? Are there real differences? It could be critical for clues to disease linkage. Not, not a statement that any of you don't already know, but I'll repeat again, primary cells. I don't, you know, the cell line stuff hardly tells you anything. I mean, all kinds of HIV strains don't grow in T cell lines. Uh, my colleague Mika is here. It took the, not the chance, ultimately if you did enough experiments, you'd find some that would grow in a cell line. And it turns out it's only those that arise late in HIV infection variants that use CXCR4. But none of the HIVs, early strains, if, I, if everybody in this room is infected and you've all been infected for a year or two or three, we never grow the virus in a T cell line. They don't grow. The tar the, those that target CCR5 won't grow in a T cell line. They sure as heck will grow in primary CD4 T cells and ultimately if there's heavy virus expression, kill those cells or lead, or lead to abnormalities of those cells. So you'd be immensely misled by studies with cell lines. Convenient for virus production. Amen. You make no conclusion of tropism from cell lines in my mind because you can, uh, being really, uh, you can be really burned at least with retroviruses and I'm sure the same would be true for any class of virus. May not be true, but can be true. 